I won't spoil the ending for you because you may want to read the curriculum vitae of Aurora Oritz yourself. But in the closing chapter, Aurora writes back to her family in San Clemente and she says, I'm fine. I have an urge to go back and take walks along the river with you and see everybody else. If I had email, this letter would get to you before I'd even turned off the computer. But there's no need to be in such a rush. When I go out to help the Ecuadorians, I'll pass by the letterbox on the corner. A week from now, I'll be heading back to that big house with its wide door and no caretaker. I long to see the chestnut trees, see the whole orchard, spend my days on the balcony and rest. And more than anything, I want to think. I've met several people lately who never think. They just decide. They decide, therefore they are. The curriculum vitae of Aurora Aritz. Aurora is a heroine of mine. She has an unconventional dream and she pursues it. Her values go against the grain of contemporary society. She wants to think and she does not need to be or be seen to be productive. She values thinking, deep thinking, and she values the time it takes to think and to think deeply. I was reminded of the value of deep thought and the time it takes to think well recently when I was on sick leave. I was quite stressed and found it very difficult to sleep or to concentrate. And on a visit to my doctor, I noticed how stark and devoid of words and images her office was. There were no books, no posters, no magazines, and not a health information pamphlet in sight. But I did notice on her desk was a little box with pens inside it and paper. And there were little twee pictures of teddy bears on the box. But the few words inscribed across the box had gravity. They said, take time, take your time, take your time to think. And it was the correct choice of words amongst all that white space. And a few weeks later, when I went back to see her, I noticed a bill of basic human rights placed on the wall above the magazine racks in the waiting room. And among the 11 rights, there were the right to say no and not feel guilty about it, the right to do less than you are humanly capable of doing. And most importantly, I thought, there was right number six, the right to slow down and think. I think all households, businesses, schools, government offices, businesses, and even churches, perhaps should have these Bill of Rights displayed prominently. Each of us needs to take time, to take our time, to take the time needed to think. And the amount of time and space that we clear and nurture for thinking has not only an individual impact, but it has a collective and even a political impact. Not long before I left the United Kingdom, I attended a seminar on leadership. And the seminar was run by the Olivier Institute, and the facilitator was Richard Olivier, the son of the great actor and director, Sir Laurence Olivier, and he was also an actor and director in his own right. And the Institute uses the plays of William Shakespeare to explore good and bad leadership. And many thought-provoking and countercultural things were discussed that day. But the thing I remember the most was a question that they asked us. They said, how do you know in schools, in universities, in hospitals, in government, in business, how do you know quite quickly if someone is an ethical leader or not? You can know, they said, by how quickly they demand that you give them an answer to their question or how quickly they demand that you make a decision. Ethical leaders or ethical people let you take the time you need to come to the right decision, to answer the question when you are sufficiently ready and willing to answer that question. Ethical people, ethical leaders, don't demand instant answers, instant solutions or instant decisions, they said. And I've sort of used that as a blueprint ever since when I've noticed people in the world and the way they move through it. And I think I agree. The most ethical appreciate the time needed to make a good decision. The least ethical hardly notice at all. A wonderful Unitarian example of this was the late Dr Beverly Littlepage. 
Beverly was a former General Assembly President of the Unitarian Movement in Great Britain. He was also a retired doctor, who at one point was the Queen's physician. He was a Unitarian lay preacher, spoke fluent Welsh, and was a wonderful musician. Other than that, he was quite an ordinary person. He also knew how to chair a difficult meeting. And we were at a business meeting in 1999 of maybe 300 Unitarians. And there was this really difficult motion, and I, I think it was to do with the war on Kosovo at the time. And uh, it was really heated. And there was a for microphone and an against microphone. Since those days, they've got one in the middle that's sort of, sort of people that are not quite for or against. But in those days, you were either for or you were against. And they were contentious motions, to say the least. Passions were running high, and it started to resemble one of the Houses of Parliament. In a rare departure in protocol, Beverly let the students speak. We were normally not able to speak to the motions. And one of my fellow students went to the microphone where promptly all her courage deserted her. Her voice shook and she was becoming increasingly flustered. We couldn't follow her train of thought and it looked as though she was about to sit down in humiliation. Take your time. Beverly's gentle but authoritative voice came from the microphone. Take as much time as you need. And she did, and she was fine. And every speaker who followed her also slowed down and took the time that was needed. Beverly then asked us to sit for five minutes in complete silence in between hearing the last speaker and taking the vote on the motion. It was one of those really special things to witness, and Beverly was definitely an ethical leader. And because, among other things, he let people take the time they needed, and it's why I, who barely knew him, was so upset the following year when he died suddenly and unexpectedly. And I still get quite upset when I think about him not being with us. May we all take the time to think. May we all know the value of time and the value of thinking. And may we know the relationship between time and thinking. And may we know how enough time and deep thought lead to actions and to decisions that are ethical. May we respect people like Aurora or Ritz, who places such value on the time it takes to think well and the lengths to which she would go to do this. And may we put in place ways so that we have the time to think well and so to decide well. I'll finish with a story of a foreigner travelling through the countryside in the Republic of Ireland. The traveller goes into a bar. He sits on a stool at the bar. He is anxious to order. However, the barman is pouring a pint of Guinness for another customer. He pulls on the, on the tap a bit, lets it settle, pulls a bit more, checks the creamy head on the drinks, shakes his head, pulls a bit more, and on and on and on it goes. Until finally, he hands the pint of Guinness to the expectant patron, replete with a perfect creamy head. That sure took a while, said the traveller sitting close by. Ah, said the barman, but when God made time, he made plenty of it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>